been in, in front of the camera uh, for the right reasons. Probably not for the wrong reasons, like some of you will. We know you've been in front of the camera for. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we're going to talk a little. Or deny. <laughs> well, you don't need to. You don't need to do either because we've got the video. Uh, you <laughs> forgot that portion. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we're what we all drink today. Question of the week, like always. We're going to go through some articles that we've all found, except for Dave, which makes no sense. He's the public affairs guy. He should know, you know, what articles, but he, but he didn't do no research. And then we're going to do the topic of the week. So, Dave, I would love for you to uh, to do your best to try to make yourself seem more important than me. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, and just so you know, um, you were correct. Esteemed means help and great respect and admired. So you were spot on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well played. Yes. All right. Yeah. So I'm Dave. Uh, I spent about 25 years in the U.S. Army. Most of my last 15 years of that was as a public affairs officer. Uh, I was a public affairs officer for a couple of different organizations, one being the, the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, used to suck. Uh, Army Special Operations Command, and then uh, retired back in 2014. Spent some time at GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy as a comms guy, and then ended up uh, where I'm at now here as the Chief of Public Affairs uh, for the Corps of Engineers, the Wilmington District. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time in the special ops world when I was in the Army in public affairs, which is a little unique, uh, which is a little more related to what we probably talk about today as far as security goes. Yeah, because um, it is a different kind of skill set you need to do public affairs and in an environment where you're really a lot of times protecting more information than you're trying to advertise. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Dave and I spent a, a lot of time together, more than we probably wanted to, you know, inside of vehicles all over the all over the planet. You know, my, my side was the inside of the bubble um, and external to make sure that the the guys and gals doing training were, were safe. And then, of course, Dave did that overarching, you know, bubble even further out and make sure that the, the information from news and everything else was, was clearly articulated. So I, I know we worked together. I'm, I'm really interested to get into some of the questions. And then, of course, we got hurricane season coming up, Dave. So, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so I think that's important uh, across the thing. So let's yeah, start I this puppy that's, off. That's a. That's one of our main efforts at the Corps of Engineers as far as this time of year goes. Is yeah, that yeah. I can't, can't wait to talk about it. I got my raft ready. Like I'm just, I they, they said flash flood today, so I was uh, fixing to go outside, but it, then Will maybe uh, do it. I don't know what it's. I don't know what it's like there in Fallujah, but it's or raining sideways in here. So <laughs> Fallujah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you? Uh, what's your? Uh, what's your drink of choice today? Oh, it's this is. Um, it's kind of hard to find. It's. Um, it's great value. Donut shop TikTok. <laughs> uh, it's really good if you ever get a chance to, to, to get out there and find it. Oh my gosh. It's pretty good. It's my second yeah. cup. You just you yeah. just went all I mean the, now I know why you're so for for those that can't see, uh, you know, Dave's drinking out of a 82nd airborne uh, coffee mug with his master jump master wings on the side of it, and then he has the the most great value coffee on the planet inside yeah. of it, which just makes no it makes no sense. I, I would think you would have like a Colombian blend. In, in fact, here, let's just do this. Will, what are you drinking? Here we go. Here we go. I am actually drinking a Green Mountain Light Roast Breakfast Blend. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> Dave, that is our that is our expression every, every week. Every and week. he actually like tamed it <laughs> down because it's usually he, like a, a yeah. soy latte, light foam <laughs> on top, you know, yeah. all that, you know. He he toned stuff. it down this week for you. Yeah. Definitely. So is, some like organic home roasted. Wait till last next week. I got a special blend coming in. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and it's usually it's usually like three minutes worth of him talking. So it's like, you know, I, I can't even do it. I, I don't do usually he starts and the podcast ends. That's how long it takes him to get through whatever he's drinking. You should see how you know, try to drink beer with the guy, man. It's like <laughs> oh his, yeah. uh, his cans are just like, you know, cartoon characters on it, and it tastes like every one of them tastes like grape juice. Every single one of them. <laughs> And he's like, oh, this is really good. Try this. And I'm like, no, nah, man, I'm good. It says a man who drinks water from a can. Yeah. That's right. Uh, what's water from quantity, a can? Does that even exist? Quantity yeah. over quality, baby. Oh, so I can tell wow. both of you got umbrellas in your drinks. Whatever. Weirdos. Jake, what are, you, what are you drinking today? But what kind of coffee do you have in your cup? We got a nice, fine, roasted, pure H2O in this bad boy. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh. No hey, drizzle, uh, no froth, no foam. pH balanced. You know, that's it. Hey, Jake, I think you need a bigger water bottle, bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
Hey, I'm trying to hydrate. We never or know you all the storms you... coming through. I'm just trying to hydrate. To Walk outside and open your mouth. Well, what he does, he probably fills that back up on the back end. That's why, because he doesn't want to get up. I get it. That's yeah, cool. yeah. Exactly. exactly. Well, the other part, too, he, he it, that thing's dubbed. He has a water cooler that he just sets it in and, and drinks out of as well. It's yeah. probably That's probably the biggest water bottle I've ever seen. That, that, that's what are you day. drinking today, Ray? Um, I am drinking, uh, well, don't worry about it. Can I? <laughs> one, of, one of those mornings, gotcha. Hey, hey, it's a uh, special blend, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes. Irish blend? Yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 hey very, well, well played. I think it's from Kentucky. Let me oh, just say okay. that. Hey, Ray, I just wanted to give you a shout out before we get into the meat and like the really. I know. I'm good looking. I'm... Um, and it, for those of you out there that don't know, Ray is like very dedicated to his craft, right? And I don't remember the first time I met him. But he talked about how we used to sit in vehicles all across the Here globe we together. Here we go. I remember this one time we Here were we, uh, we were at a training event and there was like multiple locations. We're in this big, big city in the United States, right? And there's Ray doing the force protection thing. I'm doing the PAO thing, you know, keeping everything, keeping the lid on it, right? All of a sudden Ray gets a call and he's like, What? Really? Where? Oh. Uh, we'll be right there. He hangs up the phone and he fires up the vehicle. We, we just take off, right? And I'm like, oh, man. Like, what happened? You know, somebody got hurt. And we're driving. And I'm like, Ray, what, what's going on? He goes, dude, they said there's a bunch of strippers under the bridge by the Calcium doing a photo shoot. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh wow. Man. That's uh, it, it's not that type of show, Dave. Like, so uh... that, that, I just wanted to point that out how dedicated you are to your job. Listen, and, I'm. I'm. Hey, I'm he needed to here. protect him, Dave. He yep. needed to protect I'm, him. Everyone needs to listen. I care about everybody, Dave. Everybody. It was. It was like brilliant. Brilliant. All right. Wow, Dave. I, I just, had to uh, share that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize this was going to be the bus pushing contest, uh, but I can, <laughs> I can tell now. <laughs> All That's right. Nice. Well, Jake, you All got right. the you got the question of the week this time, or yeah, or, or, yeah. So. As uh, COVID's starting to lift, and we already know what Dave's going to do, because those of you yeah. who follow Dave, right, he's a, he's a sand wrestling maniac out there. <laughs> but uh, as COVID oh, starts to lift, what uh, what are you guys looking forward to the most? So, Will, what are you looking forward to the most? Surprisingly, because I, I mean, for people who don't know, I'm not really in tip-top shake like the rest of you guys are. I've gained my COVID-15. I'm actually looking forward to going back to the gym, even though that's not in the next round of – approved businesses but i'm, I'm kind of going stir crazy trying to work out at the house so I, i'm looking forward to going back to the gym what about you ray oh well, well here you go I'll, I'll show you when i show you you'll know oh man you're you're, you're talking about my hair hey, oh hey, so ray. you're gonna go get your uh frosted tips yeah like my <laughs> my hair is like it's touching my lips I, you think that's a mustache that's not a mustache that's the hair off the top of my head Two two things, right? One, I offered you five hundred bucks on your little live shot the other day to shave that. You didn't do it. The second thing is, if you can't figure out how to get a haircut, don't even yeah, say you work in cute. unconventional land. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Listen, listen, it's 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 like I'm pretending to be an E4. You know what I mean? It's like I know Sham I master. can get a haircut, but the reality is. I can use COVID-19 for a reason why not to get a haircut. Exactly. You, you know why Dave's I the only think. one with a good haircut, right? Well, because dude. he's not he's he's not an NCO. Oh, that's yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. It took, what, <laughs> it took nine minutes and 30 seconds for the O jokes to come up. <laughs> you guys are slipping, man. Jesus. Oh yeah, we we, we gotta take it easy. We gotta take it easy on you. Don't, don't want you Dave, to get all Dave, what are you off. looking forward to? I, honestly, I think this back on. Yeah. I think um, going out to eat or going just to a pub or something, you know, because yeah, like Will, Will said, you know, being around the family all day long, um, not eating at home all day long, and that, the whole thing about oh yeah, if you don't eat out, you'll lose weight. That's all bull crap. We know that now. So <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm thinking just going out to a, to a pub or something, and because I'm already, you know. The nice thing is I have the boat, so I'm at, I'm at the beach every weekend. That's not a problem. But going out, I think, just a little bit of socialization. Must be nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, it I is mean, nice. So, I wish I knew somebody with a boat who would take me out. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah that sucks to be you. Well, if he had yeah. stopped drinking like grape flavored beer, maybe he would. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. You yeah. know, it, it is straight Blue Falcon in here today. This I don't is... need the Coast Guard pulling me over, like, what are you drinking? <laughs> 
As long as I'm not driving, I'm good. Hey, hey, here's the thing though. If the Coast Guard pulled you over and then they see that he's drinking a, a Kool Aid Man beer, they're gonna be like, mm, yeah, just leave this guy alone. Hey, you guys are good. Just, mm-hmm. just yeah. keep going. I thought, I thought you had alcohol on there. So <laughs> yeah, I <thought> <laughs> Quit drinking the juices, and if you're going to, don't spill it everywhere. Uh, what about you, Jake? What are you looking forward to? Uh, sports, man. Uh, ah, so, yeah. like, I, I miss baseball, you know, um, and just getting the sports season back up and running. So, uh, yeah. it's probably the one thing that uh, I miss the most. And it's the only thing that's really affected my life. I mean, I really didn't go out a whole lot having three little ones. So, yeah, I mean, COVID minus traveling for work hasn't really affected my life too much. Are, are your kids playing baseball? No. So, yeah. Everything's locked down here, so they're they're in soccer, baseball. It was supposed to happen, and uh, you know all the sports got canceled. So we've been playing in the backyard. So, yeah. um, well, the good news for for Will is you know even though he gained the COVID fifteen, uh, most baseball coaches are you know a little bit heavy, so he'll he'll be okay. He can still coach. I can coach. Can't. Play. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't. Well, let, let's not get crazy. So so with that, let, let's just ask the question of what businesses or what industry are you. Are you are most interested in opening? So if you, if you could make it, I mean, obviously we're moving into phase two here in North Carolina, right? Uh, I think that's happening Friday, right? Friday we go into phase yep. two. Yep. Um, so if you could make the choice of what businesses we're going to open, which ones would you want to open? Will? I think we should open all of them. And if you don't want to go to them, don't go to them. I mean, that's just my personal. As long as they're like gyms, most gyms take the precaution already of wiping stuff down and other than social distancing, but that's an easy fix, you know, just limit the amount of people that can go in and have sign up sheets, whatever. So, yeah. you know, I think it should be everything's open at whatever precautions. I mean, the CDC has guidelines for pretty much everything. So, Did you see the news on uh, Brazil? I mean, I know that we're, we're here, we go down the, down the thing. Did you see the thing on Brazil today? No. I don't man. know if you guys watched it. Yeah, there's a video, I think it was yesterday. Uh, if you guys get time today, just watch it. Uh, they're, they're going through like their peak right now. Like they just keep going up and up and up and up and up. Um, but it's interesting. And and they're now doing mass graves and all kinds of stuff. Like it's just out of control. Um, they they think, think they the next really two have, weeks it'll go. Yeah. I don't think they have the health care system to support. Nope. Like, they, they don't. Yeah, so yeah, they don't. And that's kind of what happened in Italy too, I believe. So, yep. Yeah. So, and they refuse to shut down or just letting it continue to go. That's going to be interesting. I think we're probably going to be talking about that here in the, the next couple of weeks as that continues to grow. I had not paid attention really outside of the United States much other than Italy. I think Italy was kind of the focus, but uh, that's a little bit disheartening just to see that in Brazil. All right, well, let's get into the news articles. So, Jake, what did you find? What's your uh, what's your article this week? So, um, taking the cybersecurity course, so kind of mm-hmm. diving in a little bit more, and I found like an interesting article that just kind of found, which was uh, President Trump signed an executive order on May 1st limiting foreign adversaries from selling parts and from U.S. companies buying foreign-made parts for the electrical grid. And so a lot of the article was, you know, discussion as to why. And as you, as I read further down into it, it was uh, our grid was actually hacked uh, and they're tracing hmm. it back to a transformer um, wow. that they believe uh, was bought and sold by China. And there's a massive transformer in the port of uh, New Orleans that was supposed to go, I believe, up to Colorado uh, and the U.S. stopped it. Um, and so just a cyber attack of, uh, on our power grid, which is huge. You know, we yeah, think uh, we got it bad right now with COVID with things being locked down, uh, attacking this, uh, the power grid. Yeah. It's critical uh, infrastructure, right? Like that's, yeah. A, yeah, that's a huge deal. So not just, you know, for your stores, and everything else, but just, you know, defense and your 911 call centers. I mean, everything is ran off of electricity and power these days. So pretty interesting read, uh, found at CSO dot com so um, a little interesting read if people want to kind of check that out so good all right will what did you find this week buddy so once again me and jake were kind of on the same path (laughs) (laughs) so i just finished a uh, yeah i just finished a uh, like cyber security for uh critical infrastructure and i found an article that talking they did a study on like the uh top uh, economies, the largest five economies in the world. So the UK, yep. US, Germany, France, and Japan. And they did a study and it said only 30%, ugh, only 36% of critical infrastructures have a high level of cyber resilience. That's right. That's right. Which is kind of scary, right? Because it runs everything, you know, all That's of right. our transportation, our, our water, our, our grids, our power. And yep. <clears throat> the US had the highest score with uh, 50% of companies considered highly resilient. But still, fifty percent. That's not. Jake just said yeah, it. That's right. You know, they got hacked all the other day. So it's it's definitely an area. I think we 
need to step on and and dave you used to work at a an energy plant essentially right ge or were you in the aviation no i was at on the uh, nuclear side where they made uh, they pressed fuel pellets and then they built fuel bundles for reactors so you were in the infrastructure so i'm sure you're familiar with some of the steps that they took so it's just it's just something that we that they definitely need to step up i, I believe yeah, yeah, I think the nu- the nuclear industry by and large does a very good job because one, it's yeah, it's okay. regulated, right? Yeah. But uh, we were talking. I think I was talking to Will yesterday. You know, they have what impressed me about there was just like we remember in the army, you have they had a pretty good EOC set up, emergency op center, and it wasn't just. I mean, they they had all the equipment in there. They had it looked like a talk, and we would drill it, you know, routinely, it was unannounced, announced drills. Um, you had to be qualified to just to sit in a chair. Even if I was a public affairs guy doing it for 20 years, you still had to be qualified. You still had to have a couple of FEMA certs. So, yeah, I think a lot of industries can kind of follow that lead because yeah. uh, you're right. I don't think many, many do that. Yeah, no, it's good. And, and Will, you bring up a good point. Dave answered it with being regulated. You know, being regulated obviously helps, right? Somebody's checking. Yep. Um, it's, you know, same thing we talk about with businesses. You know, I think the majority of the businesses we go in, and I know you guys know, you ask them when last time I did a security assessment or just had somebody, you know, verify things. And it's been years and years and years. Um, and, the, and the problem, you guys are both in cybersecurity now or you're going through the courses. You know, probably one of the first things that they're going to tell you there is that, you know, the threat actor is is figuring out ways to attack things 24 seven. They never stop. Yep. Like there, there's never a time where there's just like a lull. So if, if you're not doing anything on your side for years to protect your assets, you have somebody else that every single day, every single minute is trying to figure out how to get into it. You're going to lose like every single time. My, my, especially, especially on those like larger high profile companies, you know, you yeah, look absolutely. back to what was it? 2014 when the Sony attack um, yeah, happened when they're going to put out that movie on North Korea and, you know, they got hacked and they had all the right steps in place when you kind of peel the onion back, but no one ever, they never did an internal check on their own systems, you know, and they never yeah. did a penetration test um, to actually see, how well it was and what was scary is, you know, one of their senior VPs actually sat on the cybersecurity board for the yep. U.S., you know, uh, for over a year. And she didn't know. And this kind of falls into Dave's world. She, she didn't know how to handle it, you know, yeah. and they got crucified in the media. Yeah. So it's planning. But, I mean, it's planning. And that's what we're going to talk yeah. to Dave about today is just like, mm-hmm. man, I can't. Um, I, I think when when me and Dave worked together once we left the military, it was definitely one of the things we were trying to push towards was you know, companies understanding that you have to have a plan. And, uh, you know, often people think public affairs, oh, it's a guy standing in front of a, you know, a camera giving this uh, pre-recorded message. And it is so much more than that. Like that is, that is only part of it. And I, and I know we're going to get into it for me this week. I think the thing that hit probably the hardest is we're continuously keep having these fraudulent claims for unemployment for COVID-19. This thing just continues to grow and it's getting out of control. Um, I, I don't know how much the people listening to this know about, uh, well, probably everybody's received the email from the, uh, the the king or queen or, you know, whoever Nigerian from Nigeria. Prince. Yeah. So like and, and that's part of it. So part of the attacks is, you know, Scatter Canary. It's a highly organized Nigerian cyber gang. Um, and, the, and they just basically employ these things. Right. To, to get people to give up data. They didn't take that data. And then they're making fraudulent claims. Um, this this is a problem. And, you know, to me, I don't understand how it just continuously keeps happening because you would think by now, I mean, this has been happening for years. This isn't like, I mean, obviously COVID-19 has just, you know, exacerbated it even more. We have so much stuff happening right now, but I, I don't know what you guys think. You know, is there something that can be done to, to, to help resolve this from, from your pictures or from, from your minds? I think Either one. Being, a, be, being aware of what you click, you know, yeah, um, and what you answer to and who you give your information to. I think hey. we've, go ahead, Dave. Uh, I'm sorry. It just popped in my head. Like I think a, a big missing piece, which goes to kind of what we'll talk about later, as far as public affairs goes, is internal communications. Meaning, yeah. your your communications officer, your public affairs officer, whatever you want to call them, um, should have a pretty robust internal communication plan to educate employees. Because if you got a large organization, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand people, it just takes one of those on your network to click the wrong button. Right. If they're not if they're not educated and trained then you're going to get attacked. Well, and that's interesting, Dave, that you say, I mean, it's a team effort too, right? Like, because most guys are going to be, oh, I'm the security guy. I'm responsible for training. Well, yeah, but there's a messaging piece to that. There's like, there's all of these pieces, you know, again, it's team effort. Everybody in the company needs to kind of come together. That's, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. Well, what do you think? 
Uh, well, I think definitely like what Dave is talking about having internal communication, you know, you should have awareness classes for phishing scams and maybe do training, fishing training, like fishing tournaments and stuff like that. Make it fun. So it's not, you know, so it's not boring for the people. So they don't dismiss it. You have different tournaments, different prizes, just stuff to help raise the level of awareness mm -hmm. of the scams and stuff out there. And on uh, like another side, if, I think if there were maybe international laws in place and enforcement that would actually go after these guys a little bit more and prosecute them, it might help. I mean, I know most places don't have the, the resources yeah. to do it, but that's why they do it because there's no repercussions or they're very, there's very little chance, even if they get caught, they're not going to get extradited or, yeah. you know, no, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, it's a hey, tough problem. Hey, Ray, go back to his point of if you, you know, why does the military do it so well? Why does, like where I'm at right now, even just the Corps of Engineers, it, it goes back to the regulated part. You got to make yep. it mandatory. You got to make it a requirement. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? And hold people accountable. Did you do your anti-terrorism training today? Did you do your yeah. cybersecurity training today? Somebody's got to track it. Somebody's got to keep people accountable. Yep. Yeah. No, I agree. And and it's, uh, you know, we always say that, you know, security is annoying, you know, in a lot of, a lot of different ways, right? Like it just is, man. Um, but there's a reason for it. It's the same thing as law enforcement. It's annoying until you need it. And then when you need it, you realize why you need it. So I think with everything else, the, re the regulation will continue to pop up. And it's definitely something you see, you know, the difference between the government and the corporate side in, in my picture or the way that I perceive it. You know, the government side, there is always, you know, a regulation, a guideline, a standard, a principle, something in place that that you were moving towards. Right. You weren't scared for people to know that you didn't meet the standard because that's OK. It's it's acceptable not to meet the standard once. It's not acceptable not to beat it twice, right? Like, I mean, but you're constantly evolving where in the corporate space, if, if, if you're missing something, it's bad. And, you know, people are, people are absolutely getting fired they, in, in some cases, not all, but, you know, so people don't want to bring it up. They just don't want to talk about it. Um, you know, consultants like, you know, like all of us that are here, you know, going into it other than you, Dave, but, you know, us consultants that go in, you know, immediately it's kind of pushed back because you're going to bring up all the bad stuff that's here. And then we, we take a lot of time and I know, especially me and Jake take a lot of time explaining that we're here to help. We're not here to hinder. We're not here to get people, get you in trouble. Uh, the, the end state of this is nobody's perfect. I've never went in an organization ever. Um, and I've been doing this a very long time and just been like, wow, man, you guys, you guys are, this is the most secure facility I've ever seen on, on the planet. And we've seen a little bit of everything. We've seen you know, nuclear plants. We've seen it all. So I think that's an interesting piece to this. All right, so Dave, let's let's talk about you. I know you, you and Will live pretty close to each other, so there, there's that. I uh, let me apologize for that. We got to deal with Will every day, and it's uh, wow, <laughs> yeah. wow. Yeah, I've been avoiding him for a while now, but he, he has. He's been doing a good job. Man. He just keeps coming back. It's like you leave juicies. You leave that, juicies on the road. That's the flip side of the question. What are you not looking forward to? In terms of <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's been, a great, it's been a great excuse. You know? ah, COVID, bro. Yeah. Social distancing. You forgot your bus driver hat there. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, then, yeah. and then I go and tackle some kid on the beach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like five years from now. It's like, hey, Dave, social distancing is done. And Dave's like, no, Will, listen, still, still oh, 10 feet away. Know. In fact, for you, it's 100 meters away. I'm at the at-risk category, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great. Well, Dave, t tell it's us kind of, yeah, he, well, hmm, let, let's not get into that. You're going to get me rolling <laughs> on him. Um, so tell us a little bit, Dave, from, from your perspective, you know, what is public affairs? And, and I think that's a two part question because public affairs to me is different in the military, the term anyway, in the military versus the corporate side. So I'd be interested to kind of get your, your definition of what that is. Yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people understand it. And I don't, I don't think a lot of public affairs folk like when I first came into public affairs it was kind of like we just take information and we give it to the media and we're done we don't shape we don't influence we don't do any of that stuff right and that kind of evolved over time at least in the military with the, the short answer I always gave people was it's a non-lethal fire at least yeah. in the military it was easy to, to tell somebody that because I would tell a commander it's a non-lethal fire and a little immediately something would click like it's a tool in your kit bag to help your organization get from point a to point b mm -hmm. right and you know, a lot of times I can't tell you how many organizations I've been in, even the one I just entered. I, I've been in this job probably about seven or eight months and they had, you know, this is one of those organizations, largely uh, DA civilians. And they knew what they knew of what public affairs was. It was that did sitting in the corner, like you said, with the coloring book, you know, and they would do like fluffy stuff, uh, you know, hey, the photo contest. 
where I come in and I'm always thinking it's it's operationally focused, right? It, it's I have to uh, you, the public affairs guy, has to understand the organization, the goals, the objectives, the commander's vision, and then learn how to apply your discipline to it. So you have to know, you know, where is he trying to go, and how can you use public affairs or information to get there, right? Yeah. Um, so, like you talked about earlier, it's everything I do. I'm always looking at trying to achieve some sort of desired effect. And people will always jump to the tactics. Hey, do a press release. Hey, do an email. Hey, do you know? When I want to go back to the first step, which is understand the situation, like what's happening, what's going on right now that affects this situation, everything I can, you know, who's talking about it, who thinks they can talk about it. Um, so there's a before, during and after piece to anything you're doing, you know, whether yeah. it's a project you got going on or, a, you know, you're developing something within your company. I want to know what's happening so I can develop. This is my communication objective. So it starts with what you talked about, right? Having a plan. There's got to be an operational plan first. And then the public affairs team or the communications team can develop, call it an annex, right? A communication plan that supports that. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do before this happens on this date. Yeah. Uh, here's what I'm going to do during that, you know, and you, you, and you walk the dog on objective. What's the effect? What does it look like if you achieve that objective? And then after you do all that, then you can determine here's the right strategy and tactic to use. And, and you know, what audiences are you talking to and all that good stuff. So at the end of the day, it's, it's something that every CEO, every commander, wherever organization you're in needs to, to pull that public affairs person close. And like you said before, that public affairs person has to work very closely and in coordination with all the other elements like security. Like, you know, if you got an intel section, if you've got a logistics section, an emergency ops section, all those pieces need to work together. Everybody's kind of in their lane, but everybody's supporting each other because at the end of the day, the only reason you're there is to help that organization achieve their goals yeah. and to stay protected. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I don't want to get in political pieces here, but I think a good example of what you're talking about with uh, shaping the message is, you know, like the president, you know, let's talk about like that piece. Um, I, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me what he says that that's not the context I'm putting it in. But the thing is, is there's, there's no filter going through, right? It's just a, uh, it's just a, it's a blurb in a, in a sense. And I think from a company perspective, you know, if you run a very large billion dollar company, whatever, some, some large company, you, you want to have a message that goes. Um, and I remember one thing that you told me a long time ago that, you know, I'd never thought about, but, you know, go, go, uh, go ugly quick. Like, don't, you know, don't try to hide things. Don't be sneaky. Um, and, and I, and I kind of laugh because, you know, our last presidents, that's what everybody's been asking for, right? Like, Hey man, why is he hiding things? And then you have, you know, who we have now, he's not hiding nothing. Um, so from your perspective, from a comms perspective, you know, what is that initial, what does that initial shock look like? And, and I know you gave some good examples before when we were doing some company stuff, but can you give me an example of a company that had something, you know, major happen that, that they positively did what they were supposed to do with messaging and then one that maybe could have done better? I think the the one that people that that jumps out as a good example of how to do it that is used in a lot of you know universities use this example all the time too. If you think back to the Tylenol um, oh, yeah. issue back in the eighties, right? Somebody somebody laced their their Tylenol bottles with cyanide, and people I think it was a couple half five ten people died I think. And they did everything by the book the way you should. One, they went out right away. That's like what you said, go ugly early. It's not going to get better. The first thing I ask myself in a crisis is, you know, um, what are the facts? And what are the facts that are, will not change no matter how much we want them to change? Yeah. And that's what you go out with first. So they went out really quickly. Hey, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and they didn't only communicate. This is the other part people miss. This, this is where everything works together, right? You communicate, but you communicate action. So what they did was they said, hey, this is what happened. Here's what we are doing. Here's who we are working with. So they ended up pulling everything off the shelves that, you know, how much money they lost on that, who knows. And they ended up keeping people informed along the way. So you go out that initial blast. And nowadays it's easy, right? You blast out a press release. Here's what happened. Here's what we're doing. Follow us on Twitter, let's say. And we'll right. keep you updated, right? So keep pushing information. You got to and they showed a lot of empathy too for the people that were affected because this was their product. Yeah, they worked with the FBI. They ended up finding out. So in a crisis, there's a lot of you know you're either the victim, you're the villain. A lot of times, um, you got natural disasters, all kind of things going on. So in this case, when people thought they were the villain, it turned out at the end of the day they were a victim as well. Somebody tampered with their product. 
long story short, at the end of the day, uh, part of their action became those childproof caps that we all can't open now, right? Um, and yeah, so, especially Will. <laughs> Will's they, like <laughs> they maintained so much credibility. It was incredible. I mean, what what was supposed to be the darkest hour of their day, right, turned out to be a shining example of it, it raised their reputation. It raised their credibility for Johnson and Johnson. Right. Yeah. And, um, and they set the standard for the industry after that. Like, you know, here's what we did. Here's why it's not going to happen again yeah. to give people the warm and fuzzy that you can trust our product. You know, that's what it goes down to is if you bury your head in the sand during a crisis, which a lot of people tend to do, they, they lose the basic principles when a crisis happens. Right. When that's when you should stick to the very basics that I just walked that process through situation, objective effect, you know, and what ended up, it, you know, so if you if you bury your head in the sand or worse, you lie about it, or you cover something up, it's going to come out. Right. Eventually yeah. it's going to come out. Yeah. So you might as well go ugly or get headed off now. Get all those facts out now. Admit fault if there's fault. And because if you start chipping away your credibility, you're done, you know, because now. You know, and, and this is where it gets into the before, during, and after. So if you're if you're doing good public affairs before a crisis, right? You're keeping a steady drum beat um, going with information of what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it's a good thing, blah blah blah. Even eh, a little bad thing happens, you go out with it. By the time that major crisis hits, you you got you have credibility with with the public, with your yeah. stakeholders. Yeah. And I I can't tell you a lot of time going back to how people don't understand public affairs that, you know, being around a lot of special ops guys who weren't really used to it. And they were doing some things where, you know, I'd have to go up to the, to the um, ops guys and be like, Hey, what happened last night? You know, a lot of bad things happened. And they're looking at me kind of sideways. Like, why are you asking me this? Yeah. And I have to explain, I'm asking you so I can maintain your freedom of maneuver to go back out there tomorrow night. Right. Yeah. If we don't go out with the facts now that we know, even if they're bad, it's going to be a crap show for the rest of this deployment. And you're not going to be able to go in those areas you need to go into because something's going to stop you either politically or uh, the population won't be in support, all those kind of things. So maintain your credibility, get it out quick. I mean, I can tell you a million examples. Look at people like Tiger Woods way back yeah. when he got in trouble. What do he do? He hid for about three months and just got cremated, you know, in the media. When all he had to do was go out and be like, Hey, here's me. I'm Tiger Woods. Here's what I did. Blah, blah, blah. I'm a, you know, I got faults, however, head it off so they have no yeah. more questions to ask you and it'll be over a lot quicker. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. We uh, I, I know for definitely me and Jake, you know, we live this world with some <clears throat> what I would say is ultra high net worth folks and then some of their you know family members. And I never realized how important it is to do that. I mean, Tiger Woods is such a good example of that where, you know, like hey, let's don't say anything. And you're like, uh, probably say so. Like, they, like this is coming. Like, I, there's not like you're, you're trying to feed every. Like, it's like, listen, it. we make mistakes, man. Like, and listen, some people are not going to like the fact that you did this. Um, it is a mistake, though. Like, it's, you know, but if you try to hide it uh, or if you lie about it, it is not going to be good. Um, and again, it, it leads back to security for us, right? Because uh, the more of a target you put on yourself, the obviously the harder it is to, to secure. So from an internal comms piece, you know, especially now working where you work, you know, we're, we're moving into uh, hurricane season, which you know is obviously a very big deal for us down here in the southeast. So I, I wonder, what, when does your, how does your process start for that? So like just natural disasters in general, which I think all across the United States, you know, everybody has something, whether it's tornadoes, you know, earthquakes, uh, whatever it is, and and each is a little bit different, right? At least hurricanes, we know they're coming, so. Nine out of ten, we can we can start this planning process. But can you kind of talk us through what the internal comms looks like and, and how you develop that plan with your team there to to not only for for you guys but also for the state because I know you're, you you help with that as well. Right. Well, yeah. Go, like right about now, a couple of weeks ago, what we'll do is is um, we'll send out a a training circular, if you will, about hurricane preparedness. Right. Yeah. And for a lot of people that have been in the district for a long time, it's it's kind of muscle memory, but it's always a good reminder to be like, hey, and, and it's easy to read, easy to, to digest. Here's what you should be doing for your own self. Because in our business, you know, when the hurricane hits, you're probably going to have to go out and support the district, the Corps of Engineers, right. and the state, and you're not going to be able to be home with your family. So it's it's to your benefit to be prepared so you're when you have to leave the house during the, the event, you know, your family's taken care of. So it's that it's pushing out information, you know, to the employees and what things they should do personally. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we, then 
you know, everything to me in public affairs is like a little ecosystem, right? So every, I repurpose everything. So why, if that training circular is good for my employees, why not throw it out on social media? So the rest of the community, because if, if everybody's prepared, you know, it's like that whole thing about don't be that guy who was told to evacuate and you don't evacuate. Now I got to send some high speed right, man. in harm's way to go get you off your roof. That's right. Right. So if I share this information that I'm training my own employees on, I can share, you know, you always look at, is this appropriate for the public as well? Then, you know, throw it out there and, and use multiple platforms because everybody ask 10 people, where do you get your information? You get 10 answers, right? So every, you know, if it's appropriate for public, it's appropriate for social media, it's appropriate for a press release, it's appropriate for a media story, go on and on and on. So it's, it's like you said, be prepared and then also be communicating. The first thing I do in a crisis or anything is as a, as a communicator, I want to clear lanes, right? I want to know, hey, Will, you're in the state. This is your lane. This is what you're going to talk about, right? If this question comes up, yeah, I got it. And if this is an, in a Corps of Engineers project, I'm going to talk about that. But I'm going to be nested with you. So, you, you know, you look at all the players. FEMA, and, 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 uh, the, the easy part is, going back to I think we touched upon earlier, is that national, uh, what's it called, the NIMS? Uh, yeah, yeah, NIMS. Incident management system. Yeah. FEMA's the FEMA's, you know, put somebody in charge, right? They learned that at 9-11, right? Put somebody in charge. Yeah, and that was absolutely. FEMA. So if I'm going to communicate first, clear to the rear, I'm going to do is FEMA. FEMA, you good if I say this? And they're going to go, yes, no, maybe. FEMA, the state. So we end up sending people to like but during Dorian, the last hurricane we had here, which wasn't a large event, but it was my first one here in the Corps of Engineers. I ended up going to the state EOC to see how that process works meeting the people face to face, which I think is huge, yep. you know, talking to the governor's uh, communication folks. Again, it's clear to the rear thing, talking to the joint information center director. Hey, man, you know, touch all the people who else can talk about this, who thinks they can talk about this, clear those lanes with those folks and, and go from there. Well, great. No, that that's uh, that's very helpful from a security standpoint, because <clears throat> I wanted to ask those questions to move us into security. Obviously, we did a little bit, like I talked about earlier, inside of the security side. Do, does the process you use now for hurricanes, right? And I'm saying the process, um, is it any different for helping a company develop an internal communication plan to prepare for a security incident or a crisis situation? And if so, how? No, I don't think it's different at all. I think, it, I, you know, here's the beautiful thing uh, about being a, a I'm used to being the dumbest guy in the room, right? Yeah. I've been, oh, yeah. Yeah, we know. Joe, look, at we're all shaking our heads up and down. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and I've been around a lot of elite people. I've had the, I've been fortunate to support a lot of elite people. And all, every one of them, regardless of rank or title or, or position, uh, are far smarter than I am, right? It's not talking about Will right now, by the way. The beauty, no. the beauty of. Louis Draker here. Oh, yep, I know. The beauty of. Uh, communication public affairs is it really comes down to common sense mm -hmm. and it comes down to processes that are tried and true that are simple and actionable. Yeah. And when the crisis hits again, I said it earlier, that's not the time to change the process. That's, that's right. the time to, to execute. So I don't care what it is. Like I've been in a lot of different various organizations. It works anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you're prepared, um, as long as you're thinking through, you know, hey, what could happen in this organization? Here's the likely things that could happen. And I'm, I'm a giant fan of what's called an RTQ. Now, I know you know this term, right? Oh, Response yeah. query. Yeah. Um, when I first got to this organization I'm in now, man, they didn't have one of them on the shelf. And I'm like, yeah. this district has been here forever. And there's got to be some things that come up all the time. Going to Tiger Woods thing. Anytime sexual harassment comes up, Tiger Woods is going to come up. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so having at least... You know, if you don't have a full comms plan, if you don't have a full public affairs guidance, at least have all these elements are the same. I, I've got two. The beauty of my job right now is I have two public affairs specialists that work for me that are fresh out of college, 21, 23 years old. And it's so fun to teach them that, look, man, this is not rocket science. However, all the I can take a community strategic communication plan. And this is what drives me crazy to call it strategic communication, call it information operation. I don't care what you call it. I can look at an 80 page plan that nobody's going to read. That's on glossy paper that has the exact same elements to it that I talked about earlier. Situation, effect, objective, tactics, strategies, audience, all that stuff. And I can do it on one page. 
And I've had many uh, senior leader look at this and go, wow, like this is brilliant because you have to show people as a public affairs person to get a seat at the table. You got to show them that you're competent in what you do, that you've thought it through. And you don't need 80 pages to do that. You need something short and actionable that they can see when they get to that tactic. Finally, they can see why you arrived at that tactic, why that's the right tactic. Like you may say, go passive at this moment. Tomorrow, I may tell you to go active because something else happened that changed that situation. Right. Yep. So a lot of people don't understand that. So I'm a giant fan of a being prepared with responses to query on the shelf. So if it does happen, it, you've got an 80 percent solution that you just quickly do. You know, and I've used that process, whether it's I've got a half hour to give the boss something to give him a, a recommendation. Because all I do is advise. Right. I'm advising right. the commander. It's like every other staff element is advising the commander or that CEO. Um, this is what I say from a public affairs perspective. I can deal with anything on the back end with the information, but I've seen it enough. I've been around long enough to know if you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you don't do that, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. So, you know, you have to you know, be flexible enough to adapt. And once the CEO or somebody makes a decision, then you drive on and have it your second, third courses of action on the shelf. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really comes down to something that you could pull off the shelf and put together in a half hour. Or if you've got an event six weeks from now, it's the same process. No. Whether, it's, whether it's a fluffy little event or it's a no kidding crisis, I can use the same template that's in my head to walk through a logical, pragmatic, if you will, process to come mm -hmm. up with the best communication advice I can give. Yeah, no, so and it's kind of like, a, right. you know, I, I think we all talk about, you know, plan and security, right? And have a plan for everything. And I, Dave, if I'm kind of hearing you correctly, that, that's kind of what you're saying is have those plans. Those RTQs are those plans. They're not perfect. They're not going to cover everything, you know. You can what if everything, uh, but having those major events, uh, those RTQs uh, as your major events, it, it's given that CEO and, and your PA, your public affairs person, that opportunity to, hey, that you've planned it, you've trained for it. Uh, you mentioned that a little earlier of, of doing those training events, whether they're planned or unscheduled to test everyone's knowledge. I, how does social media, how, how has that affected your job? I'd say, you know, we've probably seen that jump in the last 10 years and even more in the last five years. How does that affect your job, you know, getting that message out when when there's a crisis? You know, I, we've seen other companies, Ray and I, and you, you were part of us at times where, you know, companies, just, you know, either ha had a crisis and that employee is either talking to the media first or jumping on social media, hitting it out on Twitter, uh, whatever. And, you know, it's negative. So how does how does that uh, yeah. affect your job? And, and I've been doing this long enough where you know, I first became a public affairs guy in 2000 before there was social media. Oh, so right? you just you had a beeper. That's it. <laughs> we did. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I've seen it kind of come and, and evolve. And so, again, it goes back to that training piece. Like one of the things I do, the first thing I did in this new job is I went in touch. We got a lot of out state. We cover basically all North Carolina, a little bit of Virginia. We've got projects out there, lake projects, uh, regulatory offices. And so the first thing is goes back to that training piece. You just mentioned, Jake, you go out and you sit with all these individuals. Be like, all right, here's the process for public affairs. Here's the process for media. I'm the public affairs guy comes through here first. Right. Um, so you train them on best practices in social media as best you can, you know, and then of course there's gotta be policies in place to have some teeth to, Hey, if you go out before us and it's not, you know, you're not authorized to speak on a you know, particular topic, then there's gotta be some sort of, you know, ramifications on the back end. So you gotta train your employees, you know, make sure they know um, you're there to help them, you know, keep everybody straight to keep, you know, everybody employed. Um, and that kind of thing, but and, but social media work is a great tool if you use it well, right? Um, like I talked about Twitter and during a crisis, it's a beautiful. I first saw Twitter work very well in Afghanistan, actually. And we were back. This was 2011, 12, and um, watching. You know, we were training the Afghans to do basically do public affairs, to set up uh, joint information centers, to like. And man, they were brilliant at, because there's a lot of crises, right? There's a lot of bad things happening on a daily basis. And it was nice to watch them be able to put out accurate, if, just because you're using you know, 140 characters and it's quick, you still have to basically make sure that information is accurate. You still have to make sure that that information is vetted uh, and staffed you know, through your operations guys, through your security guys, through all the players, but it's rapid, right? And it's short and it's sweet. Um, 
So Twitter is an awesome tool to use during a crisis. Um, and then you have to kind of, once you train your folks, you have to kind of trust that um, you, like my shop, I got three people in my shop. I got a large district, right? I've got a lot of rangers out at these, you know, if you've ever been to Falls Lake or Jordan Lake, those are- Ranger. Four, Sorry. Yeah, they're not rangers like you would say, ranger. They're like, you know, Smokey the Bear kind of rangers, right? Yeah. Uh, like, but they're like often, kind. At, like in my district, um, we have several districts within our division. One, you know, in Charleston, Savannah, Jacksonville, Mobile. And some of them, unfortunately, have a problem with not being able to trust that their rangers are going to be timely and accurate with their Facebook pages, let's say. I happen to have some really great rangers that have been doing it a while that trust, you know, the guidance I give. And I don't need to control it. I want to go to Jordan Lake. I don't need to come to the Corps of Engineers Facebook page in Wilmington, North Carolina, because those guys are on the ground. You have to trust the people on the ground that are operationally doing the work. Whatever, whether you're a large corporation, you got all these outstations, trust, give them guidance. You know, it's basic leadership principles, right? Give them guidance, give them their left and right limit, let them go. Correct, make corrections along the way. So I'm able to just sit there and kind of, you know, we share, we collaborate. You put something on your Facebook page about Jordan Lake, I'll put it on mine because you're just getting a broader reach. There may be somebody here in Wilmington that wants to go to Jordan Lake. You know, tell me, you know, all the water safety stuff I need to know about Jordan Lake. I guess in a nutshell, it, it's training and it's trust and it's leading and guiding, you know. And again, CEO, communication guy, got to be locked at the hip. I yeah. got to know the commander's vision and, and, and intent so I can use my public affairs discipline to help him get there. Yeah. And, and what I would say for the security folks listening. So Dave, you said at the, the time before this was really, you know, for you to understand what you are trying to shape a message about, you know, our job from a security standpoint is to figure out what the assets are um, and then what risk, threats and vulnerabilities we're trying to protect against. And then from that, we can come, we can sit down with you and, and then kind of start working through what those, you know, threat actors, you know, what, what they're going to do, what that looks like. So if you're in a cybersecurity company and you have one person, well, you know, the, the fear of that one person getting hurt kind of minimal, but what you do have to worry about is like all of your customers, right? All their data being, being hacked and, and all of that. So I think it's really important to understand from a security perspective that when you're coming up with mitigation, as, as we talk about, you know, mitigating the threat, part of that is your communication plan. So I know for us, it would be going to Dave saying, okay, hey, here, here is the things that we're going to put in place to help mitigate this. How do we need to say this correctly, not only to the senior leadership so that they understand what we're trying to convey, but also if it happens and we put a plan in place, you know, what does that one pager look like? So somebody can physically go pull this down and we're going to talk about EOC in here in a second, but whatever it is, EOC, SOC, whatever the, the, the mechanism that organization uses that we can walk in and say, hey, hey, boss, this is the thing. This is what happened. Here you go. And then all of your different sections, whether it's uh, information technology, you know, your security guards, like whatever it is, everybody has that one thing that they know we've tried it. We've practiced it. We understand it. Um, and, and the message that we send out is the, is the proper message. So I just wanted to put that into context for security guys and gals, because I think it's super important. So you should be using your internal comms uh, person as much as possible. So Dave, I definitely want to talk about the EOC. Again, EOC Emergency Operations Center. For some, it'll be Security Operations Center. You know, there's so many names going around right now of you know like incident what these things are. Incident um, command. Yeah, incident command. I mean, it's just there's a lot. Uh, the bottom line is for the military folks, you know, think of it as a talk. You have all kinds of different uh, disciplinary pieces of a company or a region that are inside one location and they're doing lots of things to to protect something or to protect against something. Um, or to deter something or to respond to something, whatever the case may be. What I would love, Dave, for you to kind of talk about from, from your background is you've seen two different types of EOCs, um, if, if, if I'm accurate. You know, one was kind of the GE EOC, which is, you know, that piece. And then now you have kind of your state level response EOC for all kinds of stuff, right? Natural disasters, the COVID-19, you know, is a good example right now. So can you kind of explain, you know, is, is there a difference uh, between those? You know, is the function the same? And then why would a company want to invest in having an EOC of some sort, even if it's not some huge talk? Right. I, I think it's well worth investing in, number one. And, and all of them that I've seen, all the ones in the military, obviously, we've all been there, the jocks, yeah. talks, whatever. Um, and the, the different levels, they, they all basically have the same elements. You got to bring in all the subject matter experts in with all these inter, you know, all these disciplines and put them in the same room. So everybody's got a, a shared picture of what's going on. 
And the biggest difference I've seen, let's say from the military to let's say GE, was the first time I did a drill with GE, I was kind of like, hmm. I, I was impressed at like, one, it's gotta be, you, you have to dedicate some assets, I'm sorry to say, at least some tables, some infrastructure. You can't be bringing in laptops and trying to plug in. And, you know, you gotta have some something there set up as well, phone lines and all that good stuff. Um, so when something does happen, you can just fall in on it and go. And GE learned that through Fukushima, GE Itachi did, because when Fukushima happened, you know, the reactor uh, melted down, obviously, but it wasn't a, a G, the GE's problem at that time was reputation management, right? Okay. They didn't have anything set up. So they were like in this makeshift conference room. So taking all that time up front to just get set up is not a good thing. You want to just be able to follow and go. So there's that. And then you have to put, you have to invest in training somebody to be what we called in the military, a battle captain or the, right. the head of that that's DOT. Right. You know, because that is imperative that that's the person who has to be uh, charged by the boss to make decisions. You know, it, I think we've all worked around uh, a guy named General Crystal, and he did this brilliantly where he said, I'm giving the at that time he called the chief staff. I'm giving you 75 percent decision making power because I'm going to be out and about doing things and looking up and out when you're in here. You know, you save that 15 percent or so for me. However, here's what you know, here's your lane. So you got to have somebody in that that EOC that's in charge. When people are talking over each other, he shuts it down and he or she shuts it down and gets everybody back on track. And all information funnels through that person. And and he or she is making decisions for the boss. So anywhere I've gone, you know, like I went up when I like I said, I went to the state EOC. It's it's set up pretty much the same way. There's a main room and then there's all these off rooms where everybody's kind of working and then they come together. There's always an element of I called it earlier, the joint information center. All the communicators have to be in that one room. Right. So that's the because what's our tool? What's our main tool? It's media. Right. That's, right. So that, that's our mouthpiece to get the information out. So we have to maintain those relationships with the media. So there's got to be a trust. And when you there's nothing more beautiful than having two old pros working together with the comms guy who's trying to do certain things and, and the reporter. You know, if you have a reputable reporter that you can confide in and talk openly with on background, if you need to, to educate. Uh, before you go on the record, that's that's a beautiful thing, you yeah. know, because, yeah, you know, I think well, we're not going to talk about it a lot today, but that's one thing people forget, too, is they say the media. Right. And, yeah. you know, reporters are just like anybody, like soldiers. There's good ones, bad ones, experienced ones. You know, um, you have to find those ones that you can tap into, that you can trust, um, that are reputable, that the public trusts. And if you can get a reporter to say your message from their mouth, that's a beautiful yeah, well, I and, and I think it's important to say you're not you're not shaping what they say in a sense, but uh, kind of. But realistically, what you're doing is you're providing them the the facts of the situation so context. that they, yeah, context because that that's the thing. You know, like I I wa I just saw something yesterday where everybody was pissed off because a reporter reported something on um, oh it's 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 gaming related, so it's like the Xbox and PlayStation and. And Tim Sweeney said this, but he didn't say it. The reporter just reported it. Well, Porter didn't have all of the information, so he just like said something, right? Because they didn't give him all the information. But if he had just sat down with the uh, with the you know the reporter and laid this out, then go on record and say what you're going to say, they have the context that they need to formulate the the right picture. And again, that's not all. You know, there's there's not you know not all are reputable. Uh, we know that. I mean, that's just life in general with anybody. But I think that those are those are good points, well, which leads me. That's the key to your public affairs guy, though, right? It, yeah, a lot of, that's it's absolutely. Engaged disengaged. And that's why yeah. your public affairs comms guy has to have those relationships, has to know who those reporters are. Oh, this is so-and-so doing this story. Wait a minute. I got to I have to engage and, in, in, you know, fill her in a little bit because I know she's going to be a little bit off, you know? Yeah, yeah no, no, that that's great. So I, I do want to talk about that because I'm, you know, I'm a firm believer in, in doing exercises like that. You know, we were actually setting one up for a company at, at one point. So for me, talk me through, so, so we, we've done our planning, right? We put a plan together. We've, we've kind of evaluated that plan a little bit, but now we, we want to do a full-blown uh, exercise. Okay, so, so doing pieces of the plan is, to me is different than doing a full-blown exercise. Right. And, and with that, one of the interesting things that I, I loved about our conversation before was to actually have media come in sit in a sit in a side room so i, I don't want to give that away kind of kind of talk through that like why would somebody want to bring in media during an exercise like that to help them be better prepared for you know an incident or a crisis 
Yeah, uh, I'll tell you, um, I'll, I'll start off with a, with a story. What, it, again, goes back to training, right? Yep. So and, and in the Army, we would say the best spokesman is, is a soldier, right? If mm -hmm. I did kindly go on the, the media and it says spokesman, by and large, the, the public's going to be like, oh, this guy's full of crap. Right. But if I go on there and say a specific job title, the subject matter expert on something and, and that person is articulate and that person, you know, can shape and craft a message in eight second soundbite to get it out. That's powerful. Right. So that's that's where the training comes in. So you, these exercises you're talking about, um, I used to do a lot of, you know, one, you got a tr classroom training for one, let's go to soldiers just because it kind of the idea that comes to mind. When Jake, when we were, I used to train all the soldiers in the special forces qualification pipeline, right? So I would train them in um, uh, in the classroom first, and then at some point during their pipeline, I would go back when they weren't expected it, call it like a media ambush, and we would do um, put them actually on camera during the situation, right? And the person, what I would bring with me was a guy I knew that I saw him grow up from a Fayetteville Observer reporter to an AP reporter to the guy who wrote you know, the book about capturing Bin Laden, very reputable reporter. I can trust this guy with the most sensitive information I ever had. And I bring him with me because I can act like a reporter. I can pretend to be a reporter for a training exercise, but a reporter will ask some very simple, basic questions that I didn't even think of. For instance, we, we, were, we trained these guys earlier in their pipeline. They were out on this tar, we were up in AP Hill and they were training, they were out all night, they were tired and they're getting poked in the eye with sticks. And the, the scenario was we were, we were friends of the G chief, right? And he invited us in. So me and Kevin are sitting there. These guys are out in the woods and we're watching all this. It was uh, simulated going on. This guy was wounded. He came into the aid station. They, they captured this missile, blah, blah, blah. So I train these guys, right? Anyway, they show up, they're tired. They see me and they're like, ah, oh, no, you know? And the G chief's like, hey, these are my friends. You're gonna talk to them, right? So they had no choice. So all of a sudden this, this one kid, poor guy, he was brand new. I think he was like second, first lieutenant. And I, so first question I ask is, what have you guys been doing? And he's like, uh, you know, this, this was, you know, they're out all night, right? He says, oh, we were recounting training areas. <laughs> and the very first question my buddy, the reporter asks, isn't that easier to do at night? And he's just like, ah, and he was just deflated from there. So he started off lying, which was yeah. first rule number one, right? But it was his first instinct, right? And then we just started digging at him. Hey, tell me about this guy that got wounded. Oh, nobody got wounded. Wow, I was sitting here, you know, so. He started digging a hole, digging a hole, digging a hole, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And bigger. I saw uh, that poor captain. I saw yeah. him later uh, in a parking lot at Fort Bragg, and he's like, "Hey," he goes, "You know what, man? I hated you that day. Hated you." He goes, "But you know what? I learned so much from that day." He goes, "I will never do it again. I never did it in real life. I never did it again." Yeah. So the basic principle, and, it, and this is another thing: when during a crisis, you're going to be tired. I don't care if you're a CEO of a large organization; you could be up all night. You're going to be like jamming on this thing all. That's when your mind starts to go. That's when these training and processes come in. Don't change it during a crisis, but apply it, right? So same thing during the EOC ops. You know, you got to you gotta trust each other in that EOC. You're going to be tired. You're going to be working long, long, long hours. It goes back to just being prepared and having that training and using it. Yeah. Well, Dave, I can't, uh, you know, we, we all can't thank you enough for, for stopping by. We appreciate the, the work, obviously, you're doing here in, uh, in the great state of North Carolina. Um, with the uh, Corps of Engineers, you know, we're looking forward to I'm not looking forward to hurricane season. Hopefully it bypasses us because we're so prepared because you're prepared, right? <laughs> like you've uh, you're sending out messages, making sure that the storms go the other direction, like the one that just did that just uh, was pretty close there to uh, to the Wilmington area. So I, I don't know if you have anything else on your side, man, that, that we kind of missed today that you wanted to chat about real quick. Ah, uh, no, man, I'm looking at my notes here. I think we pretty much covered everything. Honestly, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more. I could talk about this stuff all day, but um, I, I think at the end of the day, the message that a CEO I would give is, is you know, hire yourself a quality communications person that understands that it, that understands they have to understand operations, yeah, um, and be operationally focused. Thinking that non-lethal fire mentality, you you won't be uh, you won't be disappointed at all. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Jake, Will, any any questions from y'all? No. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Thanks, appreciate Dave. it. As always, all the insight. Hopefully our listeners uh, take something out of that, you know, and apply it uh, to the companies that they're either helping or if you're running a company, you know, the, the importance of putting that message out and yeah, making sure it's absolutely. clean. So, Absolutely. Yeah, good. All right, Dave. Well, thank you so much, man. Can't, can't, uh, can't thank you enough. Uh, quit, quit wrestling on the beach, man. It's just awkward. Hey, 
and they got to quit. They got to quit challenging, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Dave, listen, man, you're not, you're, you're not twenties no more, man. Like you just gotta, you like there's no double dog outside. daring. But hey, as soon as that kid weighed about 160 pounds, exactly. If you about a buck seventy, I'm not, I'm gonna be like, ah, oh, I can't, man. I gotta hang out. <laughs> we gotta see a matchup of you and Will. Oh, that would be great. You oh, know what? Yeah, yeah I, I, I can't like move it. that quick anymore. Yeah, <laughs> we, hey, with his juice box, like you guys are running <laughs> yeah. towards each other, like, Capri mm. Suns running towards you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, everybody listening. Thanks, Will. Where where can they find us? Go to uh, coffeesquadpodcast.com. You'll be able to listen to us on all your favorite you know, podcasting platforms. channels. Platforms, uh, go ahead and subscribe, follow, comment, let us know what's going on. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just uh, search uh, Coffee Squad Podcast and we'll pop up. Bam, there you go. So that was uh, episode 12. So thank everybody for stopping out and we'll see you next week. Have hey, a good weekend. Right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Dave. See you guys. <laughs>